Good morning. Thank you for coming today, and thank you for being in service this morning as we worship Christ. Isn't it beautiful to be here? It is. I feel the presence of the Lord. Well, I'm going to ask that you would open your Bibles, if you would be so kind, to the book of Joshua, and uh, if you would turn to chapter number 10. We're going to get there, but not for a little while, but Joshua 10 will be the place where we meet today in the Scriptures. I want to take a moment and really encourage you next Sunday, well, to be here, of course. We have our superintendent from the Assemblies of God who's going to be with us. He'll be speaking at a conference on Saturday, and then he'll be preaching Sunday morning in both services. And if you've ever heard Doug Clay speak, and I got a feeling that not a lot of you have, um, Doug oversees the Assemblies across America. And uh, you're going to enjoy this great preacher of the Word of God. And uh, I would love for him to, to get a good flavor of Pueblo Praise Assembly. And uh, so would you, would you come and would you bring, bring a friend with you, if you will. Today, for this message, I want to speak on the subject of loyalty. Let's say that together, loyalty. That's a good word, isn't it? It's a warm word. To me, it's a word that you would hear on a cold winter night, almost like a blanket. And loyalty is a Jesus word, because Jesus is so loyal to you and I. The gentleman's name was John Wesley, and you have read books on him, no doubt. Mr. Wesley said, give me ten men that hate nothing but sin and love nothing but God, and we will change the world. And when I heard that quote for the first time, I thought, that's a good quote, but where are the men? Where are the men with the loyal spirits? Where are the women with the loyal spirit to God? Sometimes as people, we serve the Lord. Well, we serve Him when we need Him. We serve Him when we want to. But you know, God calls on us to be faithful to Him every step of our life, every day. And some people will serve the Lord when they're in trouble, when, when they get in, caught in a mess, then they, they want to run to God. And some people don't serve Him in the mountain experience in life. And sometimes when you're in the mountain experience, you forget about God. Have you ever forgotten about God? And yet so many people do, and yet even though you forget Him, God is still faithful and he's so loyal to you and me. Amen. And ladies and gentlemen, today I, I just want to weep when I think about how good the Lord has been. Has God been good to anybody in this room? Amen. He's been so good. And really, in all reality, he's been good in areas that you don't even know he's been good. God has watched over you like a shepherd. And God has shielded you from some things in your life. And when I think about loyal, I think about God. It's a beautiful word. And when you see or when you hear loyalty, it just has a way of warming your hearts. This past week, I went to a funeral for a Loa Lyle, and uh, it was on Thursday, and, and uh, I think 95 years old was her age, and a lot of faithful people from the city of Pueblo, from various churches, gathered together, and we did a send-off service for her, and and it was beautiful to see a life so faithful through that many years. I wonder sometimes in your life and in mine, will you be serving the Lord if God were to give you 95 years? And I watched her life and I listened to the words that were said about her and I thought, what a, what, what a beautiful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she loved God. And even Pam in our office who wasn't able to attend the funeral, but Pam, Pam mentioned that it was Aloha that taught her how to bake a lot of things in her life. And here you have this servant of the Lord in this church for many, many years, decades, if you will, and she would have women at her house and she would teach them to bake and oh, how they would laugh because Aloha loved to laugh. And she was such a loyal servant. If you didn't know her, I wish you could have met her. Sometimes in life it seems like loyalty is not as common as it once was. It just seems to have faded over time. 
And another word that describes loyalty is faithfulness. And if everybody in this church was as faithful as you, how faithful would this church be? And if everybody was as loyal as you, how loyal would this church be? Loyalty is an absolute essential in human relationships in society. Of course it is. And without loyalty, no body of people can even survive. Did you know that? If soldiers are not loyal to their commanders, what happens? Defeat, the falling of a nation. If rulers are not loyal to citizens, what happens? Corrupt government takes place. And if people are are not loyal to their government, what happens? Anarchy and the overthrow or the replacement of that government. And we're seeing a breakdown of loyalty in our own lifetime. As we're watching a lot of disloyalty, I think, by people that hold very important offices. A.W. Tozer said these words. I I think they're good. It's a little long, but listen. Uh, Christian churches have come to the dangerous time predicted long ago. He says, it's a time when we can pat one another on the back, congratulate ourselves, and join in a glad refrain, we are rich. We are increased with goods, and we have need of nothing. It is certainly true that hardly anything is missing from our churches these days except for the most important thing. We are missing the genuine and the sacred offering of ourselves and our worship to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on and he says, My own loyalties and responsibilities are and always will be with the strongly evangelical, Bible-believing, Christ-honoring church. Tozer says we have surged forward. We are building great churches and large congregations. We are boasting about high standards, and we are talking about a lot of things like revival. And then Tozer dropped this line in his quote. He says, but I have a question, and it's not just rhetorical. What has happened to our worship? Are you and I loyal to worship Christ? For many people, you just come to church, but you don't worship. And Tozer asked the question then, what has happened to worship? Ladies and gentlemen, babies are being aborted left and right by the thousands, oh, wait a minute, by the millions, wait a minute, by the tens of millions, and sometimes we can just gather in the house of God and go through the motions. Children are being hurt. Women are being destroyed in houses. But what has happened to our worship? You see, I think when it comes to loyalty, when a church really steps into knowing what loyalty is all about, we understand how worthy of praise God is. And the day that you quit realizing how worthy he is of worship is the day that you stop worshiping. Many people today feel like they don't need God. I don't have to have God. I did that when I was a kid. What has happened to our worship? A university student wrote to J.R. Tolkien after reading Lord of the Rings. He says, you have made loyalty and courage more meaningful to me. Loyalty doesn't get much press today, the young person said. It's present in the lives of many, but it isn't heralded like it used to be when people signed a letter that they wrote with their own hand, your loyal friend. Remember when people would send letters? And on the bottom, sincerely, your loyal friend. What has happened to loyalty? Perhaps the most intense place to experience the drifting in commonly, it's commonly known as the EAC. What in the world is the EAC? Well, it's the East Australian Current. What do you know about the EAC? If you've ever seen the Disney movie Finding Nemo, you've been exposed to the EAC, which runs from the Great Barrier Reef down to the coastline of Australia. Well, not quite as fast as it's described in Finding Nemo, it is nevertheless powerful enough to move entire populations of marine life from one part of the ocean to an entirely other parts. 
at over 62 miles wide and almost a mile deep. It's a force force to be reckoned with, the EAC. The culture we live in, the people we surround ourselves with, and the circumstances that we come in life can act like an EAC in the course of our lives. The question to ask is, when it comes to life, will you go with the flow? Or are we strong enough to rise above the current and to continue pursuing Jesus Christ? For a lot of people, you just go through the flow. That's really what you do, is you just go through. Everybody's doing it. All families are doing this. We just go with the flow. But loyalty says, I'm going to rise and I'm going to raise the standard of my relationship with Christ. You see, loyalty is a great virtue. And we often forget that simple truth in the cynical age in which we live. Our society is so rife with corrupt leaders and so hostile to the concept of authoritative truth that loyalty is often perceived as a weakness rather than as a merit. Come in close. Rebellion and defiance have been canonized as virtues instead. Solomon said in the Bible in Proverbs chapter 20, In verse 6, many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. And it's amazing that Solomon would have said those words, a faithful man who can find. Where are the faithful men? Men that have their families in the house of God. Men that are seeing their children know how to pray. That young man that you heard from, Mr. Austin Hines, I know his family well. His wife comes from an Assembly of God preaching family out of Texas. I believe her father was a superintendent. His father, Lance Hines, a great man of God, a preacher, spent over 23 years in Africa. That young man that you just heard from, over 23 years of his life and of their life and spent in Africa preaching the Word of God. And a lot of brothers, Lance has a lot of brothers, the Heinz boys that are in ministry, faithful and loyal men that have preached the Word of God. And I wonder sometimes, where are those faithful men? In the book that I'm going to read to you in Joshua chapter 10, here's what you're going to hear today. Let me give it to you. You're going to find that Joshua's loyalty was to the Gibeonites. And if you weren't here last Sunday, you'd be a little lost there, but you might have to go back and listen to last Sunday's message on the Gibeonites and who they were and how they kind of had snuck in the camp, but the nation of Israel allowed them in, and then Joshua felt the responsibility because he made a covenant with them, and then Joshua lived up to the covenant that he made with these people. And it is amazing today in our own culture how people make promises and they don't even mean them. As a pastor for over 32 years now, standing in front of couples that say, I do, a lot of times they really don't, but they say, I do, and they make a covenant between God, and they don't even mean it. And there's a beautiful, beautiful responsibility in loyalty, and you're going to hear it from the life of Joshua. You're going to find that the Gibeonites, they were loyal back to Joshua. He was loyal to them. They were loyal back to him. And isn't that really what all of us want? We want someone to be loyal to us, and we are loyal to them. You're going to find in the text that Joshua ultimately was loyal to God. He was a man that was probably going to disappoint some people, but he did not want to disappoint God. Do you live your life like that? God, I don't want to disappoint you. My friend, you're going to find in the text that God's loyalty was to Joshua, and not only to Joshua, but to the nation of Israel. I believe that the United States was founded on biblical principles. If you're with me, come on, someone say amen. I believe that it was founded upon that. I believe that there was a group of men, come on somebody, a group of men that built this nation upon the principles and the fundamentals of the Word of God. But America today has wandered far away from those fundamentals and that covenant relationship that we had with God, and maybe even you. 
And I just want to share with you two things. That's it, just two. And I've got a couple of things to tell you in point number one, and I've got a couple of things to tell you in point number two. But really what I want to tell you is, number one, that Joshua demonstrated victory in keeping his word, his promises, and his commitments. Grow up and live like that. In Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, the Bible reads like this. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to the destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon, watch this, had made peace with Israel and were among them. Verse 2, he feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all of its men were warriors. As I read that to you, I say the name Ai, and if you haven't been in the series, you might be thinking, what in the world is Ai? And I got a letter in the mail, and Bonnie read it, and, and, and I read it, and I handed it to her, and she said, honey, that is such a cute letter. It was written by hand from someone. They wrote a letter, and, and, and as they were writing to me about the sermon and the series in Joshua, they said, when you said Ai, I thought you were talking about artificial intelligence. And we both chuckled as they, were, as they were writing that. You see, to understand the book of Joshua, you've got to go all the way back to chapter 1. I don't know if it was Pastor Phil. Someone reminded me this week that I've been in Joshua since June. <laughs> it's November, folks. And we're only in chapter 10. I said, we might be in Joshua in June again. I don't know, but we're going to go through the Word of God. If you like that kind of preaching, say amen. We're going to go through the Word of God. But to understand the book of Joshua, you've got to go to chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says here some very important words. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Is that not written from a loyal God? And listen to this. In Joshua chapter 1, they hadn't even went up. They haven't even gone through the battles that they were going to go through, like Jericho and Ai. And if you remember in the preaching, Ai beat the nation of Israel, and then the nation of Israel fought them again a second time. And then they were victorious because, because they put their perspective back on God. And then you read about the Gibeonites. But before all of those names in Joshua 1.5, God made a promise to Joshua. He said, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. And can I tell you that the Word of God is written not just for then, but for now? And God would say to you and me in this room right here, you that are listening, you young folk that are listening, God would say that I'm a loyal God and I will be with you all the days of your life and that you'll never go through a storm, you'll never go through a valley, you'll never be on a mountain peak when God is not with you. And some people want to throw the towel in because they're going through a difficult time in their life and they're wondering, God, where are you? And God is saying, I'm right there with you. Turn to me, lean into me. And I think about my buddy Troy here, went through a life of drugs, and if you know his story, a life of drugs, not, not, not a week, not a month, not a year, decades of his life spent in drugs. But today, with the mom and dad that were faithful and loyal, and a brother that was faithful and loyal, that would pray for this young man, and I want to tell you, he stands on the front row today, because God is faithful. God is faithful. And he's faithful to you. Some people go to the doctor and they hear a very, very bad report and it scares us. And I understand that. I was raised by a warrior. Come on, somebody. Anybody else in the room raised by a, a warrior? And man, my mama could worry with the best of them. 
And sometimes she would get so worried, I would worry that she was worried. And then sometimes, like a rabbit, it would jump right on me, and all of a sudden, now I'm worried. And people that worry can make you worry if you're not careful. But for some of you, you get a bad report from the doctor. And if you live long enough, that's going to come. My friend, you're not always going to be 18. Someone say amen to that. But as the body ages, as the body, as the body grows, and as the body gets older, come on, some decay will come into it. And you're just going to go through some stuff in life. And there's going to be some times when you don't understand it. But bless the Lord God Almighty. You can lift your eyes and say, God, I thank you that you're walking with me. Sometimes we feel all alone. And I think God knew that's the way Joshua was. Could you imagine following Moses? How many times in his own insecurity did Joshua would say, I'm no Moses. I'm not that man. I'm not going to lift my staff. Seas aren't going to split. How many, how many people in, in this room today, in your own insecurity, when you look at your own life, sometimes you feel like I'm not good enough. And I think we all have a story. I was told my first week of preaching that I wasn't going to make it, that I wasn't fit for it. And I'd like to walk over to the man, and I know who he is. I'd like to grab him by his big ears. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and I'd like to pull both ears out and say, I'm still here, Doc. And I'm glad that I didn't listen to that guy, because if I would have, I would have probably went and did something else. But I felt like there was a calling on my life. And I think that Joshua needed to be reminded. So God comes and he speaks to this man. Come on, this man, this general of a man, this warrior of a man. And he just says to him, you know, the way I was with Moses, I'm going to be like that with you. And I think for you today, whoever you are and whatever you are and whatever you're doing in life, in your job, in your ministry, whatever it is that you're doing, I think God just wants to get close to you and just say, I I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm here with you. I've preached in some pretty incredible places, and I don't mean that by fancy and rich. I just, like, God, how in the world would you ever put me here? And every time that I've ever graced a pulpit, just like I did today, I know I can't do it in my own strength because I'm not good enough. But with God, come on somebody, if I have God, if I have God, if I have God, and, I, and, I, and I'm awkward enough to believe that standing behind me is something that you cannot see, that standing behind me there is a host of power, I believe that standing behind me that the Holy Ghost is behind me, in front of me, and on the side of me. And I believe as you sit in this room with whatever it is that you're going through, that that same Holy Spirit, that same Jesus, and those same warring angels are in this room, and they're battling for you. Come on. They're battling for you. And you can live in your fear. You can live with all of your junk, or you can live in the hope that I have Jesus with me. Man, I find, I find a lot of hope in that. And I think Joshua needed it. Maybe you need it too. Is there anybody here that needs that? Seven of you? Some of you didn't speak, but you raised your hand. I think we all need to hear that. God is with me. Say it with me. God is with me. So, so a couple of things under point one. The, the Gibeonites, what they did really was that they would appeal to Joshua to honor their treaty. You see, Joshua as the leader could have just said, okay, Gibeonites, um, there, there are some battles that are coming. I don't want to deal with those battles. I don't want to deal with you. Get on out of the camp. You go fight them. But Joshua would honor the treaty between him and the Gibeonites. And I think that we can learn from that. In, in verse number six, here, here it is. Watch this. And the men of Gibeon, can you see them? They sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal, saying to him, watch this, do not relax your hand 
from your servants. Come up to us quickly, save us and help us, for the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. Watch this. Joshua's loyalty in keeping his word and doing exactly what he had promised is a dynamic example for you and I. Are you a person that keeps your word? You don't have to answer it out loud, but are you? Or do you give fake promises to people so that you can get out of them what you want to get out of them? We must keep our word. We must do exactly what we say. Our word should be our bond. And you know what? I really miss that old America where your word really meant something. And when I look at the old America, that that a lot of houses were sold, come on, not with banks. They weren't sold with banks. They didn't gather lawyers in a room. You got yours and I got mine. But houses were sold to families by the handshake of two men. And I kind of miss that America where there was that kind of a loyalty of, sir, I trust you. Our word should be our bond. A person should be able to depend, should be able to depend upon exactly what we say. Our yes should be yes. Our no should be no. We should say exactly what we mean and mean exactly what we say. When we make a promise, we must keep it. How many boys in our city make a promise to a girl just so they can have sex with them? They don't mean it. They, there's no love in that. I just want to get what I can out of you. I want to use it up. And then you know what? When I'm done with you, I'm going to push you away. And I'm going to get me another one. And that's why Proverbs chapter 20 says, a faithful man who can find. You see, when we make a commitment, we must keep it. A person must be able to depend upon our commitment and upon our promise. When we speak, we should not lie nor speak deceitfully, attempting to deceive a person. When we make a promise to a person, the person acts upon our promise, and you ought to live up to what you say. Man, that's good preaching. Pastor, that's good preaching. They ought to send me another high school to tell them that. Secondly, under point one, I want to tell you that Joshua marched right in front of the enemy. Joshua chapter 10, verse 7, So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all of the people of war with him, and the mighty men of valor. Oh goodness, I would have liked to meet these guys. You see, these men were on a mission. Let me ask you a question. Are you on a mission? How many people don't even know what mission you're on? You're just living. You're just existing. You're just breathing. And for all of us in the room, God doesn't have any accidents. There's no accidents in here. God has a divine, supernatural plan for your life. And these men that were with Joshua were men that trusted their leader, and they were on a mission. What mission are you on? For some people, you're on a... I complain mission. That's my job in life is I complain and I, and I nag and I'm negative and I'm critical and I'm always finding what's going wrong and I'm always looking around and I'm always finding what they could do better. But how about you get on the mission of Jesus Christ? What mission are you on? They were on a mission. I promise you, for everybody in this room, the path ahead, it's not that it may be difficult. I think it will be difficult. But my friend, it yields rich rewards and blessings if you remain faithful. You see, when I was in ministry and growing up, and Pastor Jim mentioned Brother Wilson, so I will too. Brother Wilson pulled me aside, and I didn't have a lot of lunches with him. I was with him for a lot of years. I didn't have a bunch of lunches, but I had some. And he would tell me, he would say, son, preachers out there today don't last. And there we are eating our sandwich. He was a unique man. He would only drink a cup of coffee with only 
He'd only wanted half full, and that waitress would know to come back in about 10 minutes and then fill it up again. And man, I learned some of the greatest things in life from him on faithfulness and loyalty. He would, he would tell me that you're going to find that in ministry that a lot of people, they just come and go. They just come and go. They just come and go out of the church. They come and go out of churches. In fact, when I started in youth ministry and Phil did, the average stay for an average youth pastor in America was six to nine months. And then he looked at me in the eyes and he said, are you going to be that fella? And then he told me, he said, stay with me. Walk with me. Learn with me. And then I would be with him for like nine years and then I would go to the district office and I would come right back because I knew in him that there was a standard of loyalty that I loved working with. And I want to promise you something. The road ahead of you has a lot of trials, but there are some blessings and some promises from God if you remain faithful. So I would say to you, don't quit. And I would also say this carefully, and I want to I think this statement out, but beca become the change that you desire. Yes. Become that. God bless you, sweetheart. And I would say keep going. Don't ever stop. Don't ever stop. Be faithful and be loyal. Secondly, I want to tell you this. In your notes, I want, to, I want to speak about Joshua because he was a very loyal man when it comes to prayer. Joshua's loyalty in prayer. Joshua 10, verse 8, look at this. And the Lord said to Joshua, can we stop there for just a minute? Would you look at this text with me? And would you see that God is a speaking God? The Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. You see, they were with the Gibeonites. Joshua was fulfilling his covenant with them. He had made a promise. He was going to live up to it. But because of that promise, there was going to be a lot of war activity that was going to come against him. And here comes God again, speaking to Joshua, telling him that not a man is going to be able to stand before him. So you see God speaking to Joshua. Anyone who has had the pleasure of teaching a young child to pray might remember the feeling of learning in and leaning in to hear what the child says to God. Have you ever had that pleasure? Well, we have prayed with our boys, and now Stephen and Catherine are pray praying with Avery, and it's so cute because when, when they pray for Avery, and they ask God's blessing on their little family, on their home, Avery will always chime in and bless our puppies too. <laughs> so the other day they were at the house and we had a little slide in the basement and Avery was sliding down the little slide and Avery hurt her leg. So I immediately, like a grandpa, pulled her close and put my hand on her leg. Oh, dear Jesus, in the name of Jesus, touch beautiful Avery. And oh, God, help that pain to go away. And then right behind that came, and help our puppies too. <laughs> and if you've ever had the privilege of listening to a child pray or helping them learn to pray, you really get to know their heart. You get to know their heart. And you know what is beautiful with Joshua? That God knew Joshua's heart so God would speak to Joshua. I think sometimes that God doesn't speak to us because God knows your heart. But when you get your heart right with the Lord, when you really clean some stuff out of the gutters of your own life, maybe you will open a runway where God will speak to you as well. Let Him speak to you. You see, the astounding thing about this rich narrative in chapter 10, I want you to hear this. 
It's not that the son stood still, but rather that the sovereign God listened to his servant Joshua's request. If there's anything that blows me away in Joshua 10, is that God listened to Joshua. Now, in my Bible, the heading of Joshua 10 is this, the sun stands still. And for those of you that haven't been coming to the series, Joshua was in a battle, a fight, and he needed more time to demolish the enemy. And he looks up to God, who he's got this great relationship with, and he says, hey, look at us, man. I need more time. And God would cause the sun to stand still. And my friend, in the Word of God, does it not say the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Does it say that? Say amen. amen. So if God did that for Joshua, then could he do it for you now? You see, God will do anything, even if it means sun standing still. When your heart is aligned with him, my friend, God is able to do anything. You see, God the Father listened to his child, Joshua, pray, and he listens when we pray too. That makes me want to pray right now. Joshua is not changing God in any way with his prayer because prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of God's willingness. Let me explain. In response to his child's prayer, Joshua, God would suspend the laws of nature because Joshua's prayer lined up with God's will. This is beautiful in the relationship between Joshua and God is that Joshua, he wasn't asking for some crazy sports car, but rather he was praying because of his relationship with God, and it was in complete alignment with the will of God. So I would ask you the questions, the prayers that you pray, are they aligned with the will of God for your life? When our will aligns with God's will, and when we delight ourselves in the Lord, the Bible says that He gives us the desires of our hearts because His desire becomes our desire and His will becomes our will. Psalm 37, 4. God assured Joshua they would be victorious over the remaining confederacy, saying, Do not be afraid of them, for I have handed them over to you. So I want to say this to whoever's in this building right now. Whatever mountain is ahead of you, whatever obstacle is ahead of you, whatever mess is ahead of you, I want to tell you today that if God is for you, who could ever be against you? You see, God is not saying anything different. Rather, he's saying the same thing. Fear is natural when one faces cities gathered to fight against him, but he tells Joshua not to be afraid. There have been talking all kinds of crazy stuff. Russia, China are going to strike America. I don't know. I don't know. Iran, I don't know. Ships are going into that area right now, and we're all looking at it, and all of us are saying, I don't know. But there is some stuff that is brewing in that Middle East right now, and I believe there's some stuff coming right into our own country right now. And some people talk about terror cells. Are they here? They're absolutely here. And many of them are just waiting on a command for them to step up in America and to begin some great devastation. But I want to tell you that no matter what comes, come on somebody, if you have God, you have everything. If you have God, you have everything. And a lot of people live in terror. You know why? Because they may not have God. You have you. And you, my friend, can become your greatest enemy. You see, Joshua in the text needs to hear once again that God had already delivered these next cities into his hand. He needed to receive the words that not one of those cities would be able to stand against him, and God gives it to him. Man, I want to, so bad, I want to bring this into our zip code here. 
because some of you, you got some news and you got some reports and you've got some kids and you got some things and God says none of those things are ever going to overdo my will for your life. My friend, you can trust in God. That's good, isn't it? Say that with me, I can trust in God. You see, these are the same words uh, from the same God as Joshua faces a different situation. Oftentimes God speaks the same words to us, not because God doesn't have anything new to say, but because we, are, we either get spiritual amnesia or we are hard of hearing. If God is doing anything new, then the newness is based on the oldness of his established word. Wrap your mind around that. He never says anything that contradicts what he has already said. Psalm 37 verse 23 teaches you and I that the Lord orders the steps of a righteous person. God not only orders our steps, he also orders our stops. Come in close. We often cause ourselves a great deal of trouble if we step when he says stop and we stop when he says step. And as Christ, our great high priest, intercedes for us, believers must pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question to you. Is God saying stop or is God saying step? And when God says step, are you stepping? And when God says, stop, are you stopping? Joshua was so lined up with God that he knew. Which of us in this room would pray to God and say, let the sun stand still? How many of us would go out at high noon today and say, let the sun stand still? And Joshua prayed that prayer. And do you think that his own, in his own heart that he thought that God was going to hear him? Of course he did. And I want you to look at the brilliant strategy in verse 9. When Joshua came up suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And I want to look at God answered, God's answer caused panic in the enemy's camp. And I want to make that relatable to your own life. That God's answer caused panic to the enemy. And what, if, what would happen if you and I would become so aligned with the Lord Jesus Christ that we would cause a panic in the enemy's world? Here in our city, we talk about all the stuff the devil's doing. Really, what's God doing? What are you doing? What's the church doing? We talk about oh, how all these drugs, all these drugs, but what about all this God, all this God? We talk about all these problems and all these issues, but what about God? What about the Holy Spirit? We talk about all, all these mountainous things, all these things that are going to destroy America, but what about what's going to build America? That is the Lord Jesus Christ. T take, take a look at this with me. Joshua 10, verse 10. W would you read with me? Is it on the screen? Let's read. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with the great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon, and he struck them as far as Azekah. Yeah, you say that word. Now I want you to look and see what God was doing. Look at what God is doing. The Lord threw. How many of you know God can throw? The Lord threw. And he threw them into a panic. And he struck them with the great blow. <laughs> Are you reading this? And my own prayer in this city is God strike the enemy with a great blow. Strike the enemy with a great blow. And then at Gibeon, he chased them. God is a God that chases. 
chased the enemy. He hit him and then he chased him. And then he struck him, struck the enemy. My friend, do you know God like that? And I want to tell you that the panic, it was caused by a great hailstorm. I want you to read with me again, verse 11. Will you read with me? Will you read with me? Verse 11. And they fled before Israel, and while they were going down to the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiah, and they died. And there were more who died because of the hailstones than the stones of Israel killed with the sword. And there's a principle for you and I to learn in the book of Joshua, and that is this, is that God can do more than you can. God can do more than you can. You can do a lot. Okay, you're good. Okay, you're great. But you're nothing like the Lord. God can do more than you can. You know, when I, if I could bring this into our modern day, when I look at Israel and I see all the stuff that is happening and those reporters, I was watching this morning and a reporter hit the ground because bombs were going off and he's talking into the camera and he's laying down on the ground. And I want you to know, friend, that none of that is going, none of that is happening outside of God's view and his lens. And if it takes God throwing hailstones to protect Israel, and, and how in the world is Israel going to make it? And how is it that nations say that we need to wipe Israel off the map? How is it going to make it out there? Let me tell you how. Because God is going to protect them no matter what comes. Now, 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 listen, listen. Not only is he going to protect them, but he's going to protect you. And he's going to protect your kids and he's going to protect your grandkids. You see, you and I are engrafted into this thing with Israel. Israel is the chosen race. But we Gentiles who have come into the faith, we have been engrafted into that. My friend, listen to me. We are royalty. We are members of the household of God. And God is going to take very, very good care of his own. I want you to know that God answers by causing the sun and the moon to stand still. Verse 13, would you read, read with me one more time, everybody, say amen. amen. Okay, verse 13, and the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. How many of you want to meet Joshua when you get to heaven? <laughs> I'll close and just say the Lord listened and God answered Joshua's prayer. The Lord listened. Verse 14 and 15. Would you read with me just one more time? And I promise you this is the last time I'll say one more time. Verse 14. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel, and so Joshua returned and all of Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. And the chapter is not done in chapter 10, but we're going to be done for today. And God is fighting for you. Oh, my friend, God is, God is fighting for you. God is fighting for you. He's fighting for your kids. He's fighting for your family. God is fighting for you. God is fighting for you. God is fighting for you. Let me ask you a question. Are you fighting for him? What you see is a harmony between a man and a God. And great things will happen when that takes place. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah.
I want to ask that you would st step out, if you will, those of you that can. Why don't you come and stand in the altar with me? That would be a beautiful thing. We'll stand together. Would you come? We'll stand just for a few moments. Why don't you come? For some of you, it's 10 steps. For some of you, it's about 70 steps. I counted it all the way from the top row one day, and I forgot how many. But why don't you take about 70 or 80 steps, maybe 30 or 40. Why don't you come and stand? Oh, friend, let your, let your prayer align with God's will. Sometimes we pray for the wrong things.